Good afternoon. If you have, if you have heard of MapReduce, Bigtable, Spanner systems, protocol buffers, you have heard of Jeff Dean. It's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Jeff Dean. Uh, he is currently uh, is Google senior Google senior fellow. Uh, works in the research division with a very long list of contributions and accomplishments. Um, he received his PhD from University of Washington in 1996, uh, working with Craig Chambers on uh, compiler techniques for object-oriented languages. He is a fellow of the ACM, a fellow of the AAAS, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, a recipient of Mark Weiser Award as one of the most distinguished awards and quite affinity I have to that um, with Mark Weiser, and ACM Infosys Foundation Award in Computing Sciences. Jeff. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. So um, what I'm going to be doing today is talking about some work that we've been doing about the last five years or so at Google on using deep neural nets and uh, understanding them from a research perspective and applying them to a lot of different kinds of uh, interesting computer science problems. Uh, I'll point out this is joint work with many, many people. I'll show you know, citations and you'll see that there's a large cast of characters uh, doing a lot of this work. Um, so the background is that uh, this project started when I bumped into Andrew Ng in the micro kitchen at Google uh, about five years ago. And uh, he was spending a day a week at Google on uh, kind of uh, as a consultant, uh, as a Stanford, fac Stanford faculty member. And you know I had done some, uh, undergrad thesis work on parallel training of neural nets. And I was like, I, the, the model of neural nets kind of appealed to me uh, back then. But uh, like most other people, um, we sort of decided, oh, well, these are kind of interesting for toy problems. They don't really do anything you know, significant for real problems. Um, and then there was kind of a lull in neural network research activity for uh, 15 years. And Andrew said, oh, actually, they're coming back now. They can do kind of cool stuff. So I said, well, why don't we train really big neural nets? That would be fun. Um, and so that was kind of the genesis of this project, um, where we basically wanted to push the boundaries of what we could do in terms of training very large neural nets on very large data sets and see what we could do, in, particularly in the areas of perception for speech and, and uh, sort of image understanding, but also in, in language understanding. Um, so I'm going to cover kind of some of the experience we've had in using these uh, systems for research and also some of the production applications we've, we've uh, employed them to and also talk about some of the computer systems that we've built in order to scale training of these models to uh, very large uh, problems. Uh, right. Those are the three main areas I'll cover. Um, so. Uh, throughout the talk, I'm going to suggest some problems that I think would be useful to glance at from a more theoretical lens. And I'm not a theoretician, so I will just throw these out as potentially interesting problems that, that might merit a bit more sort of rigorous understanding. So uh, feel free to look for that symbol on the slides. <laughs> um, so just to kind of characterize how much deep learning has taken over within Google, this is uh, the number of different source code directories in our large source shared source repository that contain model description files for our neural net training system. And what you see is this almost exponential growth of uh, model training files across many, many different areas. So if you look at the names of the directories, it's like you know, Gmail and ads and search and you know, image understanding and research and OCR and all these different kinds of things. Uh, people have discovered that these tools really are um, applicable to a pretty broad range of problems. Um, so first, a cartoonish introduction. Obviously, one of the really nice features of these kinds of models is that they can take in very raw forms of data. So they can take in pixels of an image and feed that through a set of hierarchically developed uh, features. And eventually, at the top, you get out some classification, if it's a classification problem, saying, is this a cat or a dog? Um, and you can train this entire model jointly so that you train all these different feature layers. And the, lay the 
the features that get learned at different layers grow in complexity and higher, level, higher levels of abstraction as you go up the model. Um, so more formally, uh, most of the pro work we've been doing is in the area of supervised learning, where you have a bunch of labeled examples that you care about, where you have both the input and then the desired output. So these could be images with you know, the pixels of the image or the input and the actual label saying that's a cat, that's a cheetah, that's a garbage truck uh, being the output. Um, and the goal is to train a model, some function of the input, that is going to give you something closely approximating the output across all the different input examples, input output uh, pairs that you have. And then you're going to learn by optimizing a set of parameters in this model, by making little adjustments to all those parameters over time so that you hopefully can minimize some loss function that you've defined that says how close are you to the actual truth for all the different examples. Um, and as I said, one of the nice properties is that you can feed in different kinds of input and get out different kinds of output from these models. And kind of by mixing and matching these things, it's very applicable to lots of different problems. Um, you know, so it has current state of the art and a pretty broad set of different kinds of problems that are things that people really care about. Uh, so here's, I'm going to go through now some examples of things that we've used neural nets for in real production products. And then I'll go through some of the uh, sort of underlying optimization problems. So one of the first problems we turned our attention to uh, was the problem of doing speech recognition in collaboration with our speech, speech team. Um, and there the problem is you take some acoustic signal and you're trying to eventually predict a whole, uh, uh, the text of an utterance. What did the user actually say? Um, and so by applying a deep recurrent neural network, and a recurrent neural network is one that sort of feeds the output of one time step back into the next time step as an additional input signal. Uh, so it has a state that it kind of keeps updating. Um, we were able to reduce the word error rate by more than 30%. That's, that's a huge number. That's uh, some of the people on the speech team said that's the biggest single improvement they saw in speech recognition in 20 years. Um, Around the same time, people started trying to use neural nets for image recognition in a bit in a large scale, sort of much more uh, unstructured kinds of images. People actually, convolutional neural nets were originally developed by Jan Lekun and others at at and Research uh, uh, to read handwritten numbers on checks in the late 90s, I believe. Um, and so the, all the checks that you write in the US go through a convolutional neural net to determine that it was $17.23 or whatever. Um, but people, uh, in particular, Alex Kruszewski, Ilya Sutskever, and Jeffrey Hinton at that time at University of Toronto, um, decided they would try to apply a deep neural net to the image net classification problem, where you have very you know, photograph-like images and you're trying to classify, is that a cheetah or a cat or a dog or a, you know, a, a car? Um, and they actually uh, did very well, as you'll see in a minute, at, in this particular contest. Um, since then, people have been sort of taking this basic idea of convolutions, which are essentially sets of parameters that you apply at all different spatial locations in an image. Um, and the same parameters are then repeated in, in this spatial uh, way. Uh, and they've been exploring different ways of putting these convolutions together. And the architectures have been getting much more complicated. Uh, but the results have been getting significantly better over time. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is kind of the progression we've made in the ImageNet competition. So you have an image, and your goal is to say which of a thousand categories is this image. And you get it right in this contest if any of your top five predictions, the correct answer is in there. And you get it wrong, that's the error column, if none of the top five predictions is what the image is. Um, and so before people started using neural nets for this particular problem, the error rate had been hovering about 26%, 27% for the two or three previous years of the contest. It hasn't been going that long. Um, and then uh, the supervision uh, AlexNet year, the error rate dropped significantly. So the second place person that year did not use a neural net and got about 26% error as well. Um, so there was a huge drop in error rate, and people kind of really latched onto this as, wow, this is really transformative for the problems that computer vision is concerned with. Um, and then over a sequence of several years, uh, Clarify was a company started by my summer intern after he finished school, 
uh, he got 11.7%. Uh, the next year, Google entered, and we got 6.66% uh, uh, error rate. Um, one of the people who administers the contest at Stanford, it's a, run by a Stanford research group, uh, Fei Fei Li, Andre Karpathy decided he would subject himself to a very rigorous machine learning like uh, training and test regimen. And so he sat down and, and took a bunch of the images and sort of trained himself to say, is that a Basset hound or an Irish wolfhound or a, a garbage truck? And he, he did about 120 hours of training. <laughs> yeah, and he convinced one of his lab mates to also do it, but they only did like 10 hours of training. Um, and then he subjected himself to a set of test images that he'd never seen before and had to classify and use this metric. And he got 5.1% error rate. Um, so not bad. His, his lab mate, who didn't train as much, got 12% error rate. So um, the dedication helps. Uh, study, study hard, I guess. Um, so I mean, you see that you know, computer vision is not a solved problem, but there's been huge advances, at least for this particular task and a whole bunch of other computer vision tasks over the last five years um, in improving the error rate. And one interesting trend is actually the number of parameters in the models has actually been going down. A, a common trend is that you'll tend to have a parameter that you learn, but then you'll reuse that parameter many times in the computation for a single example. Uh, and that actually helps for doing things like fitting these models on mobile phones where you don't have necessarily that much memory. Um, and also helps for training because there's just less parameters to train. Um, and we've deployed this. I actually get to use my vacation photos. We, we had a cheetah jump on our car one time, which was kind of exciting. Uh, and um, so we now allow people to search their photos without uh, tagging them at all. So we sort of just detect what kinds of objects we see in those those photos that they uploaded and then allow you to search so I can type cheetah and find my cheetah picture. Um, you know, this is real users posting things. So they say, wow, the new Google Plus photo search is a bit insane. I didn't tag those. And he searched for statue and got, you know, his statue pictures, including ones of gorillas, I guess. Uh, or C, um, you know, drawing works. Uh, if you're going to have a few categories of objects, you should clearly have Yoda. And it, we're pretty pleased that we could detect that macrame Yoda, because that's not a typical looking Yoda. Um, people have been doing interesting things where you look at the way in which the model activates and kind of um, back propagate all the way into the pixels of the, of the original image. And you can actually do interesting things like generate art, where you say, well, the model sees a little bit of a bird here. Let me enhance things to make it more bird-like in that particular area of the, the image. And you do this just by this sort of numerical calculation. I can kind of generate these kind of funky pieces of artwork. Uh, depending on how you, where you select data to backpropagate into the model, you can get these kind of nice visual effects. You know, that's pretty nice art. It's about the only kind of art I could produce. Uh, um, people out, outside of Google, so these uh, three authors are at the Max Planck Institute and the University of Turbergen, they've factored a model. So you give it two images. One is a photograph and the other is a painting, typically. And it renders the photograph in the style of that painter. And you can see this actually does a pretty good job, right? Like you give it a Van Gogh-like thing and it takes that image and it makes it Van gogh <laughs> It's not bad. Um, okay, so uh, one of the other things besides images that we care about is sequences. In particular, uh, there's a lot of sequence data in the world. Text is a natural thing. Uh, a lot of the um, audio uh, data forms a natural sequence, time series sequence, video data forms a sequence. Um, and so three of the people in our group, uh, Ilya Sutskever, Oriol Vignols, and Kwok Lee, uh, tackled the problem of sequence to sequence translation. Uh, so if I have an input sequence and I want to generate a particular output sequence when I see that input sequence, um, that was the problem that they, they wanted to capture. And the reason they want to do that is you can input a sequence and produce the activations of the model after it's sort of uh, seen all the elements of the sequence in order. And those activations are very representative and are all you need in order to do things like uh, 
essentially, if you connect this to get, together, you can now decode. So you're essentially encoding this sequence into a fixed dimensional vector. And then you can use that, the values in that fixed dimensional vector as input to decode uh, from that to another sequence. And with training data, for example, you can connect uh, English and French sentences together as one is the input, one is the output, and you actually get a machine translation system that actually outperforms state of the art on, on a particular machine translation task. Um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, it turns out this is pretty applicable to lots of different kinds of problems. So you can take English sentences and as training data use a parse tree representation that has been linearized uh, as the target sequence. And that model will essentially learn how to parse without ever being told what a parser is. It just knows that when it sees uh, input sequences like this, it should produce output sequences like that. And that also gives state-of-the-art results on a particular kind of parsing task. Uh, grammar as a foreign language is a nice title. Um, it can even do interesting things like learn different graph algorithms. So if you give it a sequence of points as input, uh, and depending on the particular way you train the model, it can be trained to emit the convex hull from that set of points. So it essentially knows nothing about convex hulls, it just knows that when it sees this set of points, it should output you know, just the subset of them in the right order that is the convex hull. Um, and it can also do uh, traveling salesman tours and Dillon A triangulations. Yeah? So quick question. In this case, when it gives out the convex hull, it does this so approximately like so It's an approximate, uh, yeah. The, all the details are in that paper, but it's a, basically the approximate convex hull or the approximate traveling salesman solution. And the problem sizes studied in here were like I think up to 50 or 100 points. Uh, you know, you train on up to 50 and it generalizes to problems even as big as 100 points. Um, and you can connect together, for example, convolutional image models and instead of initializing with an English sentence, you initialize with the high level features from a image model. So you look at the top level features of this model and you map those into a fixed dimensional vector and then that's the way you initialize your encoder. And it turns out if you have training data of the form an image plus a human written caption for that image, and you just train the model repeatedly on that, that training set, you can actually train a model to produce pretty darn good looking captions. So this is a test image that the model has never seen before. The, for that particular test image, the human data was a young girl asleep on a sofa cuddling a stuffed bear. Uh, and it's a generative model, so we can sample from it, and we get two different captions. Uh, we can get many more, but two of them are a close-up of a child holding a stuffed animal, or a baby is asleep next to teddy bear. Pretty, pretty human-sounding captions. So if you'd asked me five years ago if computers could do that soon, I would say no, but they can, it seems. Um, so one of the ways we've deployed uh, the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model in, in some of our products is uh, replying to email on your phone is a big pain because typing is, is painful. Um, so we have this feature where basically it looks at the text of the email in sequence. So this is an email received by my uh, teammate from his brother saying we wanted to invite you to an early Thanksgiving, blah, 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 blah. Please bring your favorite dish, RSVP, by next week. So we have a small neural net that predicts would a short response be reasonable for this email? <laughs> <laughs> a simple classification task, and in this case, the answer is yes. So then we activate a much more extensive, computationally intensive model, and we try to predict what short responses would be plausible given the context of that message. Um, and it actually works pretty well. So you know, the three responses the model suggests are count us in, we'll be there, or sorry, we can't make it. Um, it's a pretty nice, pretty nice feature. Uh, Another product that uh, is influenced by neural nets is the, the Android app for Google Translate. So essentially you can hover in camera mode over it and it runs an OCR model, OCR computer vision model uh, on the pixels from the camera. And then when it detects text, it translates it into whatever language it's configured to, to translate to. And this is particularly handy when traveling in countries with uh, different character sets than, than you're on, for example. 
Um, okay, so the basic building block of all these models is the neuron, where you have some input values, which are floating points, dot numbers, typically, and some weights. Those are the parameters of the model. And then you compute the weighted sum of those inputs times the weights, and then you apply some nonlinear function. Uh, traditional neural nets in the 90s, everyone used sigmoid curves, typically these nice kind of smooth s curvy things. Uh, more recently, people have discovered a lot more success with the rectified linear unit, or ReLU, uh, basically the max of 0 and x. So it just is totally off, to a true absolute 0 value emitted until you hit 0, and then it starts to go up linearly. Um, that turns out to be easier to train. It also has the nice property that it gives true zeros as, uh, as output when the neuron is sort of inactive, which you can sometimes take advantage of. Um, so essentially, you have this neural net with inputs, which can be, as I said, a bunch of different kinds of uh, categories of data. You have these parameters, and you have these outputs. And if you factor that into the different layers, you essentially have a bunch of weights at each one of these layers, uh, starting at the innermost one with the input uh, value. And that is the, the desired uh, problem. And the objective is I want to make a neural net that approximates that across all my training examples, or for the, in this case, for a particular training example. Uh, and then the loss function that we use kind of is a choice that we get to make is how are we going to measure how close we are to the desired value. And often you can use an L2 loss, or if you have some probability distribution, you might use a cross-entropy loss uh, to decide this. And you sum this over all the training data, and that is kind of uh, how you know how well you're doing. Uh, the, the best way we know to optimize these, these complex functions is essentially using gradient descent. So typically, you use small batches of examples. You might pick 64 or 128 examples. You would run the model forward, compute the loss for each one of these examples, compute the gradient with respect to the parameters, and make little adjustments to the parameters times some learning rate, uh, in or, and then compute, uh, update the parameters with those uh, updated parameter values using that gradient and the learning rate. Um, so. This neural net is essentially a very nonlinear, non-convex function. Uh, it depends on all the inputs and targets in the training set. And the number of training examples and also the number of parameters can be billions. Uh, so um, essentially, we rely on backpropagation and stochastic gradient descent, this small bat mini batch uh, um, sort of regime to in order to optimize these functions. So you repeatedly you go millions of iterations where you pick 64 examples, make small adjustments to all the parameters, and then go through the next set of examples and do the same thing. Um, and then people have developed a whole bunch of sort of uh, uh, slight alternatives to the basic vanilla backprop where you can add momentum. So you now start going in that direction, and then instead of completely turning, you kind of keep a little bit of the direction that you were going from the previous batch of examples. Um, add a grad, which learns a per-parameter learning rate, in, in essence. Uh, batch normalization, which was developed uh, by my colleagues, uh, Sergey Yaffe and Christian Zegedy, um, essentially normalizes the gradient, allows you to use much higher learning rates. Um, there's second order methods that people have developed that sort of take into account the curvature of the, the function. Um, those tend to not be used in a large scale setting just because they don't seem to outperform stochastic gradient descent for the scale problems that we care about. Um, so SGD is the best technique we know. Uh, it's pretty hard to parallelize, unfortunately, because every update you make the next set of examples you run through kind of depends on that previous update being applied. And that really means like you can't easily get million way parallelism if you have a million examples. You have to kind of do these small batches of examples and you get some amount of parallelism as I'll talk about in a minute, but you can't get sort of embarrassingly parallel million way uh, parallelism. Uh, so this is kind of a very ripe open area is how do you optimize these uh, highly nonlinear, non-convex functions with billions or hundreds of millions or billions of parameters um, more effectively than SGD.
Um, there's some evidence recently, this is uh, some work that Yoshua Bengio's lab at University of Montreal has done, um, that our intuitions about high dimensional spaces are not necessarily that good. You know, everyone thinks when you're optimizing things and you're doing uh, gradient descent, your main problem is going to be local minima. You're going to get trapped in this bowl that is kind of a, all contains you all around, but actually isn't the best value. If you were to jump over here, you'd magically get better. Uh, it turns out that in high dimensionality, there don't seem to be that many local minima that are that different from the true global minima, minimum in, in these high dimensional spaces that particularly of the kinds that neural nets uh, tend to engender. And the real problem is saddle points, these sort of very flat regions where some of the parts are going up, some of the dimensions are going up, some are going down, but it just takes you a long time to wander around this very flat plateau and start going down steeply again. Um, and so that seems to be one of the bigger problems in the optimization process, not local minima. Uh, so the, the reason we like these models is that they're both powerful and learnable. Uh, and we can learn them from data. We can learn very interesting sort of complicated functions like given pixels produce a sentence. Um, and that, that's pretty powerful. Uh, there's a whole bunch of kind of uh, not black magic quite, but like once you've trained a lot of neural nets, you learn about these things and, and the, they're not so bad, but there's kind of a whole bunch of issues that you need to deal with. You need to figure out what is the right learning rate and other kinds of hyperparameters. You know, how many layers should I have? Um, you probably need to do some data preprocessing, although it takes very raw forms of data. It's good if you kind of normalize all the pixel values so that they, they are on average zero or something like that. Um, and one I'd like to talk about in particular, which is settling on the network architecture that you're going to train. So mostly, people have come up with lots of different interesting network architectures where the connectivity of the model is uh, structured in a certain way. And that's all great. And then you connect these little units together with more cleverness. You say, I'm going to have nine layers, and there's going to be you know, this kind of convolution, and this kind of convolution, and then an LSTM at the top. Um, and it's very manual and sort of uh, intuition driven. Um, and mostly what people do today is they assume that the model structure is fixed. And so on every edge in this model, you're going to have a parameter and you're going to learn that parameter value, initialize, they're initialized randomly, but you're not going to add new edges in the model. You're essentially just going to adjust the weights on the edges that you decided should exist. And that doesn't seem very realistic to me and it is kind of very difficult to determine exactly what network structure is going to make the most sense. So uh, it'd be really nice if, while we were learning our function, we could also learn the model structure. It's a more complicated problem, but I think it might lead to more interesting and powerful uh, functions, and it would remove the need to sort of understand and pre-specify the model architecture. Um, so perhaps we can use observations about you know, which neurons are firing at the same time. We believe from neuroscience that this is a lot of how the wiring in your in, in sort of human and other brains gets set up is by looking at correlations in nearby neurons and so on, or anti-correlations. Um, and obviously, uh, we're not using biological systems, we're using silicon. So silicon has different kinds of strengths than bio biological neurons. Um, and you'd like to learn this structure in a way that remains efficient for computation. So often that means blocks of dense computation uh, in, in your model rather than individual connections that might or might not exist. So I think that would be interesting. Uh, ideally, this structure should understand communication bottlenecks in the system. So if you're trying to train a model that spans you know, hundreds of GPU cards on tens of machines, it'd be really nice if you were more likely to generate a new connection to something that was local, because communication there is very cheap. Uh, and have a few connections, say, to other GPU cards on your same machine where connect connectivity is less, but still not as expensive as going across machine boundaries. Um, and so the intuition is that these local connections should be really cheap and you should be free to add those uh, willy-nilly, as it were. 
Um, and long distance ones should be carefully considered and used only for when it's very important that you get this information from point A to point B. Um, the other thing I think would be interesting is mostly the models we use today use the same amount of computation for every example and we run through all the connections in the model for every example. And that's not so biologically plausible either because we know huge fractions of our brain are inactive most of the time. And so can we build models that are much, much larger but where we only activate kind of the right part of, a, of the model for a particular example? Like if I'm looking at a, at a, you know, at a car, the part of my brain that, that reads characters from text is probably not very active, right? It'd be nice to have that same principle engendered in the models that we train. Okay, so let me switch gears a bit and talk a bit about uh, some of the computer systems we've built for training these kinds of models. So um, what do you actually want in a machine learning system? So one of the things you want is to be able to express all kinds of crazy and wild ideas. Uh, and you'd like the system to scale well so that you can quickly turn around uh, an experiment and understand what was the implication of like the model you trained, how did that work, so that you can figure out what the next thing to do is. Um, and then as you get closer to production or publishing something, you would like portability so that you can run the same model on a different variety of different kinds of devices. You'd like to be able to reproduce these results uh, so that it's easy to share your particular uh, model you developed and written a paper about with someone else. Uh, and if you're in an industrial environment, it might be important for you to be able to take a model that you've developed in a research setting and then move that to a production, to a real product easily without having to rewrite it. Um, so one of the systems that we've put together, this is a kind of the second system we've built over the last five years for training deep neural nets and uh, it's actually more general than neural nets. You can tr do a wide variety of machine learning uh, tasks using TensorFlow is uh, the system called TensorFlow. And one of the things we did uh, when we started working on it a little more than a year ago was we said that we wanted to open source this uh, rather than keeping it proprietary within Google. Um, and so we open sourced it in early November last year. Uh, it has a nice Apache 2.0 license, which basically means you can take it and do whatever you want with it. Um, and we have updates for a distributed implementation coming probably in the next month or so. Uh, there's a nice website uh, that we put together. Uh, one of the things we put together was a bunch of nice tutorials that describe both kind of what's going on in some of these uh, different kinds of, of neural models and how to train them using TensorFlow. So the sequence to sequence model is an example of the, the machine translation model. So you actually get a whole model that you can put in English and it's, it's not French. Um, we have recurrent neural nets and convolutional nets for some image problems uh, demonstrating how to use this. Uh, there's a white paper. As I, remember, I said there were a lot of people involved, so this is the set of people involved in uh, producing TensorFlow. Um, uh, and we have visualization people. We have machine learning people. We have computer systems people. It's kind of a nice mix of, of uh, different backgrounds. Uh, it, the source code is on GitHub, uh, so you can download it, you can fork it. Uh, people seem to be excited about it. It has a lot of stars. I think someone did a, a visualization of GitHub repositories by number of stars that it's gotten in 2015, and ours was the high, high, second highest, despite being out for two months. Um, so that, that's exciting, I guess. We have lots of users. I'm sorry? Uh, I think it was the, um, the Swift language from Apple. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the motivations for TensorFlow, uh, the first system we developed was a system called Disbelief, and we published a paper about that in NIPS 2012. Um, it turned out to have a lot of the properties we wanted, so it was very nice from a scalability perspective. We could train very large models pretty quickly. Uh, it was good, easy to move from a model that you tried to something in production pretty easily, but it wasn't super flexible in terms of uh, what we wanted from a research perspective. When we started building disbelief, we kind of understood we wanted to train feed forward uh, multi-layer neural nets uh, that were big, and that was kind of the programming model we provided. 
Uh, but if you wanted to do funkier things like reinforcement learning or sort of uh, <coughs> slightly funkier generative models, it was not exactly uh, well suited for that. So learning what we did in the couple of three years we were using disbelief, we kind of took a step back and said, okay, let's keep the nice properties of our original system, but also make it much more flexible and easy, uh, easy programming model. Uh, so one of the things we added was portability. Disbelief wasn't super great for running things on phones, but TensorFlow is pretty easy to have a model trained running on your phone or on a GPU card uh, or on a big distributed system with lots of GPU cards. Um, GPU cards turned out to be very good for the kinds of computations neural nets uh, do, dense sort of matrix multiplies. Um, that's why people like NVIDIA are very happy that uh, people are using them for machine learning. There's lots of demand for GPU cards. Um, so the basic computation model in TensorFlow is a data flow graph. Uh, and the nodes in this graph are different kinds of operations, like, you know, do this make, multiply these two inputs together as matrices or add these things together. Uh, the things that flow along the edges are tensors, essentially multidimensional arrays. Um, that's where the name comes from, TensorFlow. Uh, we've added state to this general model so that you can have some variables that have persistent state after you run the graph. Uh, in particular, like biases here as a parameter, we're going to do some computation, figure out an update to make to the biases tensor, and then that node there will take the biases as input, and it's actually a mutating node, so it's going to uh, update the value of the biases tensor. And then the next time through the graph, we'll see the new uh, parameters that have been changed. Um, since we're using gradient descent, typically for optimizing these models, we've built in symbolic differentiation uh, so that you can essentially just say, here, I would like to have the, I have this loss function and I'd like to compute the, the gradient of all my parameters with respect to that loss. And then I'd like to train it. And that's essentially what you would express in your model to do gradient descent. Um, and that's similar to Theano, so we were inspired by the Theano open source package in that regard. Uh, so the graph that the user gives us is just a data flow graph, and then the implementation is responsible for making this into a distributed system. So essentially we can take that graph and map it onto multiple devices. And so here I have two different devices, the green one and the blue one, and wherever we introduce, uh, wherever we have edges that cross device boundaries, the system will automatically insert these special hidden nodes that do send and receives of the data that needs to flow across the edges in that, in that system, in, in that particular graph. And we do this for all the edges. Um, and that's transparent to the user for the most part. Uh, obviously, it changes how long it takes to execute the graph sometimes, but uh, that's all transparent. Um, and that also has the nice effect that it isolates all the communication in the system to just the send and receive node implementations. So now we can have different send and receive node implementations depending on you know, where the two different devices involved uh, are located in the system. If they're on the same machine, you can often do uh, local GPU to GPU memory copy without involving the CPU, for example. Uh, if they're on different machines, you do a cross-machine RPC. If they're GPU cards on different machines, sometimes you can use remote direct memory access uh, or use RPCs to send data around. Um, the system is extensible, so we define a bunch of standard operations like matrix multiply and vector add and so on. And then we have kernels, which are device-specific implementations of these operations. Um, and it's pretty easy to define new operations and kernels uh, in an extensible way. Um, when you're running in a non-distributed system, essentially all of these kind of different sort of software abstraction boundaries run in a single process where you have a client that defines the graph and then says, please execute this graph. Uh, you have a master that kind of coordinates everything and the coordination is easy in a single process, so it just executes and there can be many different devices here. So you might have a machine with eight GPU cards. Uh, in a distributed setting, that looks a little more complicated and there's RPCs that get sent around in order to coordinate the, the various activities. Um, so one of the things we really focus on is being able to turn around experiments quickly. Uh, in particular, it's a very different feel when you're doing research if experiments take you know, many weeks or months. 
because by the time you, your experiment finishes, you kind of forget why you started it and you don't really remember what's going on. Uh, whereas if it's kind of minutes or hours, that's a very different feel. It's like using a very fast compiler versus something that's incredibly slow. Um, and one to four days seems to be a reasonable spot for most of our work for uh, sort of experimental purposes. If you can get in, you know, one or two trainings, uh, experiments per day and get turnaround on those and start up new experiments as a result of those, that seems to be kind of people's uh, patience threshold for, for most of the work. Um, so we focus a lot on techniques that can allow us to drive down the turnaround time for experiments. Um, so the best way to decrease training time for these models is to decrease the step time, the time taken to push a set of examples through, um, uh, through, through the graph. And one of the things about neural nets is they have a lot of inherent parallelism in you know, the independent neurons in particular at a particular layer are all, in, in theory, independent of each other. Um, and the problem is distributing this work so communication doesn't kind of kill you. And there's a lot of techniques for that. But in, in pictorial terms, essentially you can take a big model like this and slice it up. Uh, sometimes you have neurons that have these local receptive fields, so they only are influenced by a small patch of neurons below you. And that allows you to essentially partition the model, uh, say like this, cut it like a cake. And then um, that means that most of the communication in the system is local. So essentially only things that straddle one of these boundaries need to be sent across the network, like the second neuron from the left there. Um, the other technique we use pretty heavily is data, what I'll call data parallelism. So uh, essentially we're gonna use multiple replicas of the model and they're gonna process different sets of examples at the same time. And they're all gonna kind of collaborate to update the model state, the parameters of the model. Um, and the speed ups kind of depend on the kind of model, uh, but we generally get pretty, pretty significant speed ups. Um, and so the way this works is we have a set of machines that are gonna hold the parameters of the model, and then we have a bunch of replicas of that model, which are each reading different data examples. And before one of these replicas uh, reads in some examples, it's gonna get the current set of parameters from this set of machines, and it's gonna then read data, propagate the examples through, compute the gradient, compute the updates that it wants to make to the, to the parameters, and then send that gradient to the centralized uh, service. And that service will then apply the gradient update. Um, and before the next example, set of examples, it'll do the same thing. Um, and so now we have uh, done two updates. And actually what's really happening is we're asynchronously doing this on all these different replicas. Um, now, this is kind of not quite the correct thing to do, right? Because in the meantime, while one of these machines had downloaded the parameters and then was computing, and then send its gradient back, the, gradient, the parameters could have moved because someone else might have updated the parameters in the meantime. Um, fortunately, this interference doesn't seem to be too bad. Um, so you get pretty good speed ups. So if you look at one GPU training a model versus you know, 50 GPUs, you get about a 30, 30 to 31 X speed up in the time to get to a certain accuracy. So this is bottom is hours and the vertical axis is accuracy for a particular model. Um, and that's enough to go from, you know, implausibly long for an experiment to like one day, uh, which is kind of what you care about. Um, and we use this everywhere. Like all, nearly all of our models that have large data sets in particular uh, use data parallelism and possibly also model parallelism as well. So, uh, one thing that would be useful is a better sort of theoretical understanding of what's going on when we have these asynchronous updates to uh, model parameters. So the, the gradients we're applying are kind of the wrong thing because they're the gradient computed at some different value of the parameter space. Um, and they still seem to work quite well. Uh, can we ca more accurately characterize under the conditions under which uh, these kinds of asynchronous trainings will work well or where they won't work well. You know, <clears throat> anecdotally, if you throw too many replicas at the problem, so the gradients get too stale, then things don't work. They're like the model just explodes or it doesn't learn. Uh, and there's kind of a sweet spot of, you know, for most models, we can get 40, 50, 100 replicas learning 
uh, quite effectively. For some of them that are sparse, where you might have a whole lot of parameters, but every example <laughs> only touches some of the parameters, you know, we can easily get a thousand different replicas training uh, in parallel. Um, so can we characterize this better, or are there better things to do in applying a bunch of asynchronous updates? Uh, so um, one of the things that is nice about TensorFlow is it's pretty easy to express all these different kinds of forms of parallelism so you can make very minimal changes. Um, so one of the things that we allow people to do is given, well, the TensorFlow implementation, given a graph and a bunch of devices, has to decide where it's going to execute which operation. And um, we allow users to specify hints or constraints on some of those characteristics. So you can say, I really want to run this, I have to run this operation on a GP, some GPU card somewhere. Or I have to run this on GPU 2 on this particular job uh, in, my, in my distributed setup. Um, and so the client can specify some constraints and then the the system is responsible for deciding, given those constraints, and also measured information about how long different operations take and how large the inputs and outputs are, um, trying to decide where it's going to be most efficient to place the different um, nodes in the computation. Um, and we currently have a pretty simple algorithm that's an active area of work, is how can we make better placement decisions uh, in order to actually minimize the time through the graph uh, it's also subject to memory limits, so GPU cards can only hold a certain amount of, of live data, and that sometimes means even if you'd like to run it on a GPU card, you can't. Uh, what can you do? So uh, you can also, it's also made more complicated by the fact that individual nodes can also be split. So I could take a large matrix multiply and <laughs> slice it that way, or slice it that way, or slice it both of those ways, and now I have a lot more degrees of freedom, but the problem just becomes harder. Um, so one of the things that people like about TensorFlow is that it actually allows you to write code that is relatively one-to-one -one with kind of the equations you might see in a machine learning paper. So this is a uh, thing called a long short-term memory, which is a very popular sequence model. Uh, it's a recurrent model. Um, and that's kind of the TensorFlow code that someone would write to define an LSTM cell uh, in there. Um, so one of the interesting things about LSTMs and the reason they work so well for sequences is they have this, so in a, lot, a traditional plain vanilla recurrent network, you have the, the state from time t, and to get to the state for time t plus one, you apply the weight matrix to the, the hidden activation state. And you kind of, as you go forward, you have this recursive application of this weight matrix. And so that leads to the problem that gradients either sort of explode or vanish as you sort of uh, multiply by the weight matrix to this power. Um, one of the properties that the LSTM has is that it allows gradients to flow linearly um, by sort of adding in the previous state with a forget factor that is also learned. Uh, and that allows gradients to flow more directly to the um, point of the model that where they're important. Um, and there's been a couple of new developments in the last uh, year or so, highway networks and deep residual networks, um, that also kind of have this similar property where information is allowed to flow more directly without going through nonlinearities, uh, but you learn when it's important to transform it via nonlinearity. Um, so in this case, this is from the residual learning paper. Uh, that information x can flow here via this identity function, but it can also go through a nonlinear layer with learned parameters. And if it turns out not to be useful to do this nonlinear uh, transformation, then the parameters will sort of gravitate towards zero, and that will effectively be a no-op, and you'll essentially just transfer data from one place to the next. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, there's a, we're doing a bit of work on that in our group about uh, other ways to do backpropagation that don't necessarily have kind of the weight matrix transform, but have kind of more randomized connections. Um, and that seems to be plausible, but 
in any case, these models that are mostly uh, linear or have a linear flows uh, seem to be pretty interesting from, because they seem to be much easier to optimize uh, rather than having these many, many uh, required nonlinearities. They have kind of these optional nonlinearities in them. Um, and so what properties do these models have that really make them easier to optimize? What, what is it that's going on in both the LSTM and the highway networks and the, um, the deep residual networks uh, that make those kinds of models so much easier to optimize? And then you can actually have very deep models. So the deep residual models paper, they had a model that was 100 layers deep and were able to optimize that uh, without problems. Uh, and what, can we characterize other kinds of properties a model might have that might cause us to come up with other kinds of, of systems that would be good? Um, okay, so if we return to our sequence to sequence model, uh, this is actually using LSTM cells. So the, those middle rectangles are all LSTM cells. And you typically unroll this in time. So you have a <coughs> sequence of time steps, in this case words, that you're consuming. And so that's sort of the, the basic LSTM cell. We're going to unroll it 20 time steps. Um, one of the things that is important in translation is to actually have depth. So we actually have not just one LSTM layer uh, going forward in time, but we have four layers per time step where uh, layer one passes its activations onto layer two, uh, and so on. There'll be a picture of that in a minute. And so this is the change you would make to your code in TensorFlow to have a four deep LSTM rather than just a single deep one. Um, the user can also specify these device constraints. So if we want to place you know, the different four layers on different GPU cards, that's the change you would make. And then that allows us to train this model by effectively um, pipelining and getting model parallelism uh, across all these different things. So after one to four time steps, we now have all of our GPUs kind of actively computing on, on the um, state in this model as we roll forward. And then we kind of continue rolling forward. And that's, that sort of allows us to effectively utilize lots of GPU cards for training one of these models, even without data parallelism. This is just model level parallelism. Um, so another thing that tends to be useful is that uh, these neural nets are actually tolerant of very low precision arithmetic. Um, so one of the things we can do to reduce communication costs is actually just drop from 32-bit floats down to 16 bits. And um, there is a IEEE 16-bit floating point standard, but we don't use that because most computers don't have instructions to deal with it yet. Uh, so we just lop 16 bits off the mantissa. And then uh, on the other end, we don't even do the right thing, which would be kind of probabilistically fill in the values. We just set it to zero on the other side. It seems fine. <laughs> um, it's also very cheap. Um, so given that these models are very tolerant of low precision uh, and that they often tend to have a lot of sparsity in the model. So the activations, because of these rectified linear units, um, a lot of the outputs of neurons for a particular example tend to be zero, uh, true zeros. Uh, so can we take advantage of these properties somewhat better? So hardware that is approximate would be fine. Like if you add noise when you multiply a couple of numbers together, that'd be fine. Well, what do we care? We're already lopping 16 bits off the mantissa and filling in zeros. Um, you know, software or hardware that's designed to deal better with true zero values. Uh, unfortunately, they're kind of randomly scattered zero values, which tends to be kind of hard to take advantage of in software. Um, low precision activations. Uh, some people have, in Yoshio Bengio's group have been uh, experimenting with models that just have a stochastic, a single stochastic bit uh, as an activation in the, in the model. Um, I think all these kind of directions are pretty interesting to explore. Okay. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, model and data parallelism really help us in reducing the experiment cycle time and that allows us to explore lots of different ways in which, you know, neural nets can be used to explore different application areas, to try different research ideas for training neural nets quickly, for, you know, uh, trying different kinds of models like sequence to sequence models. Um, the parallelization schemes are pretty easy to express in TensorFlow as are different kinds of models. 
Uh, we've open sourced TensorFlow, which we hope will lead to a more rapid exchange of research ideas. I think one of the things that's nice about, that would be nice is if machine learning papers that were developed with TensorFlow came with a companion TensorFlow model or file that allowed you to reproduce the, the results in that paper. You know, because when you're writing a paper, you often say things like, you know, we chose a low learning rate or something, and, and that's, you know, somewhat vague when you're actually trying to reproduce these kinds of, of things. Um, not, not from any malice, it's just, you know, sometimes when you're writing a paper, some of the details uh, get left out. Uh, there's a lot of people in the open source TensorFlow community doing interesting things, so this is just a, a random sampling. Someone's implemented reinforcement learning in TensorFlow and this little yellow ball learns to eat the uh, green things and not the red things, I, I forget what. Um, uh, someone implemented the, the neural artwork uh, model and you can feed in your own images. Um, someone implemented the, the neural caption generator model uh, which trains on a public data set. Um, so these, these models seem pretty applicable to a pretty broad set of areas. I think they're becoming more powerful. Uh, more, as people investigate them more, they're discovering new ways of optimizing them that are better, discovering new kinds of architectures like the highway networks or the uh, deep residual networks. Um, uh, there are a whole bunch of application areas that they're <laughs> applicable to. Um, and we've, I think, as a community, really made significant advances, especially in kind of the perceptual areas. You saw the improvements in error rate in the last uh, five years in computer vision. Um, and that's happening across a lot of different other domains. Uh, I think this will have pretty big implications for the future. Um, you should try TensorFlow if you're interested. Uh, and I think a lot of the areas in this could use a more theoretical examination to understand you know, what are the thing properties that are actually going on that make certain models easier to optimize or to, to learn, uh, capable of learning certain things and other ones are not. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah. Does asynchronous logic have a role in being able to solve some of the problems? Yeah, so the question is does asynchronous logic at the hardware level? Uh, have any role in this. Um, you know, I, I'm not quite enough of a hardware designer to know. I do know that looking at what kinds of sort of non-traditional computer hardware you might build to support these kinds of applications would be a good idea. And it's possible that asynchronous uh, logic would be, would be one of the things that would merit exploration, um, but I don't know. Uh, Asynchronous logic believers seem to always believe that uh, the, it's right around the corner. But. Yeah. Does TensorFlow already support kind of more event-driven architectures where the inputs to the network, instead of being, say, a traditional video, be more like a stream of events? Uh, yeah. So the question is, does TensorFlow support kind of more event-driven things? One of the things I didn't talk about is we have a support for a um, a queue abstraction, so you can have parts of the graph that are feeding a queue, uh, which could be like reading events from a network and stuffing them in there or something. And then another part can dequeue, and you can dequeue like only when a certain number of examples are batched up, or just when one is batched up, and so on. So yeah. Right, so um, the question is how do we deal with in a deployed setting when the model doesn't behave as we expect? What, what are the kind of things we do? Um, so yeah, I mean these are all models that are trained on a certain training set and the hope is that you generalize well to new examples you've never seen before. But obviously uh, one of the most common failure modes is where you train on something you think is representative of your data set, but in actual fact, you know, when you deploy it to real users, they, they expose it to things that are not part of that training distribution. And so you end up with examples that are very far off from any, any training examples you've seen. 
and that tends to cause um, you know some of the most uh, significant problems. Um, so you definitely want to collect a representative training set as best you can for problems where the distribution is not stationary. You kind of need to do online training. So for example, things that process query streams, the query stream changes in subtle ways from day to day, you know, because today it's the Long Island Chocolate Festival and all of a sudden now I get more queries about that. And so it's very important to understand that for non-stationary dis distributions, you need to update your model, you know, at some rate. That might be minutes, it might be hours, but it probably can't stay fixed for, for days and days. Uh, so those are kind of the two main things. But other than that, you just try to find examples where it failed and understand why, um, and augment your training set or, or augment the model to be more resili resilient to those kinds of problems. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, in the distributed system, does TensorFlow require all the machines to share the same file system? Uh, no. So uh, in particular, um, we have a way of feeding example data into a model. So if you have a bunch of distributed replicas, those replicas can either read data from a shared file system, or you could have a more centralized system reading examples and then parceling out those examples as part of executing the graph. So that should be possible. Uh, yes, probably. OK. Thank you. I'm happy to talk up to you.